So, um, as you know from the program, uh, now we move into the part where we will be discussing um, I Belong Reflections, because as you know, the project, uh, well, COVID gave us additional time to, to have even more time to work on this important topic. So we've been working for the last three years on developing different uh, interventions. And uh, when we discussed among ourselves, we also concluded that when we started this project in 2019, the field was much different than it is now. There is more work on this uh, and uh, there is more interest from various stakeholders to, to work on this issue. That's why we thought that it will be interesting to bring on the final uh, event of the I Belong to bring all partners and discuss their views and we prepared interesting questions for, uh, for each one of them. I will introduce who is now here with us uh, in this panel. It's uh, Marike Mewise, which you now met through, through this first panel and uh, who is uh, the face of I Belong Project because she was here for all um, uh, previous events as well. Uh, Marike is Associate Professor in Educational Sciences, Program Director of Bachelor of Pedagogical Science at Erasmus University, and as well, she is project leader of I Belong. Uh, then, after Marike's presentation, we will talk with uh, Miriam Lotze, who is research fellow at Osnabrück University in the Department of Educational Science. Um, we will ask a question also to Sofia Marquez de Silva. She is assistant professor at Faculty of Psychology and Educational Science at University of Porto. We will discuss with Liz Thomas, Professor of Higher Education at Edge Hill University, our partner from UK, and uh, Mary Tupan, Executive Director at ECHO, Center for Diversity Policy. Um, everybody is ready here, I assume. So I have uh, my first question would be for Marike. Um, when I was thinking of the questions for, uh, for Marike, I thought, okay, uh, at Erasmus University, at your department, you didn't have mentoring programs, so you, you introduced mentoring program of I Belong to your department, and you also, of course, integrated the dialogue days and teen teacher reflections. Um, how do you initiate change at your own department? How do you get allies on board? And how do you ensure support from your colleagues and the department to try something new? I think this is perfect continuation of the last question to Samia because uh, I think that even if you have the idea to start uh, diversity and inclusion office um, at your uh, university, you probably should start from your department first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivana. Um, yes, so when the Erasmus Plus I Belong project uh, was funded several years ago, um, our I Belong consortium started designing and developing uh, our three interrelated uh, I Belong activities, um, namely the student staff dialogue days, the team teacher reflections, and student community mentoring programs. And at my university, there was indeed no community uh, mentoring program present, at least in my course program. And in the process of developing and designing the interventions, and I would like to emphasize the word process instead of project. I belong is a project, but it was a process in which uh, we were in as a team. Um, and we have embraced uh, a whole team approach, uh, which until students, student peer mentors, teachers, support staff and managers, but that was also a process. Because as the I Belong team, we decided to first implement our interventions in four single course programs uh, in pedagogy and education uh, in our partner universities. So actually University, Erasmus University, uh, the University of Osnabrück and the University of Porto. Um, and we used a bottom up approach, meaning that we started together with our most important stakeholders in these contexts, namely our students and our staff. And we paid attention to our own specific contexts. And 
I got the approval of the former program director of the Bachelor Program Pedagogical Sciences at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And then I could start implementing the I Belong interventions that we developed as a team. And when recruiting I Belong students, peer mentors, that's what we did first, uh, I was very fortunate to have engaged, enthusiastic and proactive students such as Amina Kovac, who we will meet later today, um, who were very open about their own needs as a student and who were also very much willing to share their experiences with our first year students. So I had student peer mentors who really committed themselves to the I Belong program and together with staff members who already recognized and acknowledged the importance uh, of themes such as student belonging and inclusive education, we continued the implementation of our I Belong interventions and activities in our single course program. And I would also like to note that the team teacher reflection that we have designed and developed, which is about professionalization of staff, was explicitly designed as a team approach so that also staff, uh, staff members who were not yet very aware of the importance of the themes we address as I belong, uh, that those staff members were also reached and involved. And in this process, we have learned together that the timing of our interventions is critical so we really need to start promoting belonging right at the start of the beginning so of the academic year so when first year students enroll and it is really very important to continue the conversations and activities throughout the academic year and we also learned that we should embed the interventions in the curriculum to really create impact and to guarantee continuation. So this also goes for the dialogue in your staff team, for example. So really make sure that you embed those team reflections on diversity and inclusion in your staff meetings, want otherwise it will get lost in the daily teaching practice. And to scale up interventions and sustain the program, uh, I have learned that management support is crucial. So after the first year of I Belong interventions in my own single course program, we were able to scale up the interventions to two other course programs in our faculty as our faculty's DNI officer and our vice dean of education recognized the importance of our program of evidence informed interventions. So now we have a faculty wide mentoring program including the I Belong mentoring, and I'm really very proud of that. And you already mentioned it, Ivana, sometimes change is also created by global challenges. Uh, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic and worldwide anti-racism protests, exposing the importance of belonging and inclusion, in our case, in higher education. Thank you, Marika. I'm, I'm uh, all the time taking notes, uh, even though I was part of the project all the time. For me, it's interesting because it's really you can see uh, that it all starts from uh, two, three people that are interested and supported by their uh, colleagues, but then uh, they initiate change and it becomes a wave. So uh, it's a lot for, for two or three, but uh, then it becomes uh, like a, a whole team um, process. Um, thank you, Marike. I think that uh, by mentioning sustainability, you also opened uh, up the space for my next question that I would like to address to Miriam Lotze. Um, we know that uh, uh, you scaled up as well uh, the, the I belong at your whole university. So you started with the department, 
But then um, the others picked up and it seemed as something that uh, everybody should be on board with. So you scaled up and you basically now run I belong uh, uh, project at university level. Uh, can you explain more in detail how, how can we get to that in other universities as well to, to spark the change from our departments to several departments then to all the way to the university? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ivana. Um, yes, mentoring rolled up at UOS. So um, not only the pandemic, but the pandemic was a main aspect why mentoring was so important for our heads of the university to roll up our mentoring program from the department to a university-wide approach. And uh, the pandemic gave um, the reason for enrolling the mentoring because um, it was important to su support students um, by coming into a university um, where campuses are closed and um, all um, seminars and um, yeah you know all, all teaching teaching is online and um, so it was uh, awareness for the importance of social networks for students, uh, especially in their enrolling phase at the university. And so we uh, decided uh, that we will uh, have a conference with all deans and with all faculties to um, yeah, to explain our idea to give a mentoring um, support to all first year students so there was no um, exclusion in case of uh, this mentoring program was open for every student at the university and so uh, the the awareness um, of these social uh, networks were um, the main aspect the deans said yes that's very important for the first phase coming into university and also to create a sense of belonging. And uh, so we did not have very much uh, challenges to get them on board. The most challenging was um, that we had to fit the mentoring program into um, yeah, existing um, existing programs in the uh, faculties at the university. So that was the main aspect and the main discussion point we had. Um, and so it was um, important to be flexible with this mentoring approach um, so that it fits to all contexts at the university. You can uh, imagine that this is very important. Yeah. I think this is the main uh, I can tell about enrolling the mentoring at UOS. Uh, thank you, Miriam. But uh, I, I think we can add that probably having a very good manual that you developed uh, for a starting community mentoring program probably also helps uh, to, to adapt to different contexts and also probably helps to your colleagues to um, find a way to insert I belong uh, mentoring scheme uh, at, at their programs, even though they are from, from some other contexts. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, having uh, COVID basically uh, opened up a space uh, for, for this topic, probably more. Um, we will discuss this, uh, we will tackle this also in this panel, but we have a whole panel devoted to this topic. So uh, thank you, Miriam. I think that uh, now it would be interesting to uh, hear from Sofia uh, because uh, at the University of Porto, what they did and uh, what we are very proud of, they, they went uh, uh, one uh, step further. Uh, they basically implemented I belong at a completely different university. So after successful uh, implementation of I belong with, uh, with their department, uh, they reached out to Porto Polytechnic, if I'm not mistaken, Sofia, please correct me. But I would like to uh, hear from you not only experience 
experience of uh, reaching out to Porto Polytechnic, but your thoughts on how do we get um, other departments that are, not, well, not other departments, other universities that are not familiar with our own work and that have their own structures and ideas, how, we, how do we get them on board um, in, in, in this uh, journey? Thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for this uh, question. Yes, it's true. In fact, we try to transfer what we did in our department to another uh, higher education institution. It's not uh, Porto Polytechnic. It's a little bit uh, far away, 50 kilometers, more or less. It's the Polytechnic of Kavod Iaf. Uh, with which I already had some previous interactions regarding other activities uh, in which I was involved. Uh, so, and that's, I think it's one of the relevant issues to point is the fact that when we are trying um, to pilot this kind of project in another institution, it's relevant to have previous uh, interactions, previous relationship with, you know, uh, key uh, colleagues that uh, are also a little bit sharing, uh, you know, the willingness to, to develop and to be challenged by, by a, new, a new project. So in this uh, institution, we decided to choose the management school, which is completely different from uh, an educational department. So, but that, that was on purpose and this was discussed uh, uh, among the I belong uh, team members. And uh, it was on purpose exactly to also to test and to evaluate I belong through another experience. I think this is always a self, uh, awareness as well through other colleagues uh, way of appropriating the the project so we of course that flexibility is also very important because we are speaking about field of knowledge that are complete, completely different they have their own way of questioning reality their their questions are different from our questions uh, they have different expertise and I think that we also need to take that uh, into consideration and integrate their expertise in our own uh, project. So the project, it's not, uh, it's not the same anymore when you, when you are, you know, transferring uh, the activities to other contexts. And I think that's, that's the main issue is how different organizations with different organizational cultures are able to understand the main key points of the project and appropriate it to their own cultures and way of doing things. Otherwise, I think it, it, will, it will fail. Uh, it's not an imposition of uh, one size fits all. It's, a, it's a, a way of this is a model, if we may so, say so, this is a model. And uh, the best thing is the model is prepared to, it was tested by us, by I belong team. But it's uh, it's um, it's adequate to other contexts to understand it and use as they see most appropriate to do in their own in their own institutions. Bear in mind that this the the activities that we developed in this institution were developed during lockdown. So we were using. Um, so it was not face to face. We had some face to face meetings there just to prepare, but then the activities were during uh, March 2020. So meaning that we needed to develop other other tools to, for example, to to do the power walk online, um, to do the, the activities with the students online, with students that we never see before. So it's not like our students from our faculty, from our institution. So that was very challenging. Another issue uh, that I think it's relevant, it's not taking for granted that there is this common, common sensitivity to particular issues regarding diversity. So this is, you know, our daily basis discussions and reflections in our own department because it's education and, you know, we are, that's our main object of teaching, learning and research. But for a management school, this is not you know, their everyday uh, concerns, uh, what they, it's, it's a concern for management and for how teachers look to their students, but they are not, you know, producing theory or researching on this. 
So we need to also to create a common ground regarding language and how uh, and 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 we need to departure from there. So I don't know, for example, you know, ethnicity, social class, gender, these are not, you know, like uh, um, everyday concerns. They have these issues, but they are not thinking about this as we are, because it's by default we are discussing and reflecting on this. So that was also a very relevant issue for us, for the Portuguese team, was to realize that these kind of issues are not, uh, especially among students, they, they don't see that, they don't see differences, they don't think that diversity is a problem. So for us it was also um, a motivation to, to, to discuss with them issues from I belong and how to create sense of belong because it's not an issue. Even if the problem is there or there is some problems, they are not so aware of that due to the fact that they are in a completely different institution, concerned with other, with other issues regarding their own field. So I think that, uh, I think that looking back, um, what I would have done differently uh, and I think that for the future could be interesting. It's I, I think that we need to do some kind of collaborative research before implementing the project uh, for us to better understand the, the, the institution culture, how they work, what kind of devices and activities they already have. We did a little bit, but I think that we need a more situated approach to the context where the project is being uh, developed. Uh, to better understand, for example, the diversity of the students of this institution. Uh, so, but I think the main issue is that it's the, the, the activities of this project of, of any other more intervention focused project is to, is to take into consideration the, the context and to be integrated in uh, existing uh, activities, actions, even if they are tiny, little, uh, it needs to be integrated in some of the work they are already doing. It's not, cannot be considered as another layer, uh, completely different layer uh, of work in what they, they, they are doing. So, so I think it's, that's, that's it. Thank you, Sophia. Again, I was taking notes and I, I must say that uh, all the uh, challenges and opportunities that you listed in reaching out to different university, I, I must ask you uh, how many were you, like 20 people working on this? Because it looks like a, a, a completely new project because you have to start everything from scratch uh, when you mentioned the language and context and department and getting them on board. It sounds like you were, um, you know, 20 people on board, but I actually know that it's not true. How many were you on, on this? Uh, well, we were three. Uh, me, Sara Faria, with, uh, she's listening to us at this moment, and uh, Alexandra Doroftei, yeah. which was in fact uh, the person that led some of the activities in, uh, in, uh, in this institution. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you. No, because it was uh, a lot of work for uh, for three people. That's also one of the topics that we need to think of. Uh, and these are the resources. Very often uh, uh, what is missing is uh, human resources to implement these things. We, we can have all these beautiful ideas, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I heard so many times all of you saying that, you know, it's teaching and research, and then you have to also implement these type of activities. Thank you, Sophia. I would now um, like to hear from Liz Thomas, because uh, all colleagues before already discussed the impact of COVID uh, on uh, I belong, on our reflections, or on departing from the, the, the initial idea, moving it online. I was also inspired by for this question by by the article, well, the interview that you had last year with the colleague who was interviewing you about you know all the digital tools that now people uh, have to use, um, and what should be taken for the future, even if we return to times before COVID, what, what can we keep from, from these times? So my, my question is, what is the next step for this topic? Not only like I belong project, but for the topic of sense of belonging 
after the uh, initial COVID emergency? How will things develop? What are your thoughts on this? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like every institution, we experienced all the challenges of trying to convert our I Belong project from a face-to-face -face intervention to, to an online intervention. Our very first challenge was around doing some staff development and, and um, I know Rick is listening and it was really hard that first session thinking how we did these, how we, how we kind of embraced these quite challenging issues around diversity and, and converted them. But actually he, he and Pravini did a fantastic job working with a, a colleagues from Edge Hill University around that. And, and so uh, I think uh, Sophia mentioned this already, they converted the power walk, for example, into an online activity. What we've been able to do subsequently then is to run, for example, CPD sessions using Zoom and Teams for much, much larger groups of people using some of those tools. So that was that was one of the first opportunities. But in comparison, staff were quite easy to engage with online. And, and our next challenge was perhaps engaging with our students. So how we converted our dialogue day activities into these online things. And, and I created, I, I remodeled our second dialogue day into an online program of activities. And one of the things we did quite early on was to have a session where we talked, we did a live session with students. And we didn't have very many students turn up, even though we had a very large group. And, um, and most of them didn't have their cameras on. And I thought it would be really nice if they introduced themselves as we didn't have huge numbers. And several of them at that point just left the meeting. So I started to realise that the many challenges that that, that uh, we were facing and colleagues across the, across the world were facing around all of this. So, 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 so I suppose that that started off with the challenges and we managed to overcome those. So in the next year of implementation, we had a much more embedded model. So we connected I Belong to the course that, that was being taught. And there is a real advantage, as Sophia's already talked about, that in education, we could connect it much more. So we could we could build that idea around a sense of belonging to, to um, a student's future sense of uh, working in the in the education or childcare sectors. But I think there are arguably ways that you can do that in all sorts of sectors that, that actually part of the graduate skills of the future are around being able to work with diverse groups of people and to help everyone to kind of work together as teams. So we were able to bring things together. One of the huge advantages we then had was that it became a much longer, thinner approach. So before we'd had activities largely sort of um, at, at the beginning of the year, the mentoring was spread through the year a bit more. Um, and then we had a, had a dialogue day at the end and, and the staff development activities in the middle. But this allowed us to spread it through, through the first semester. So that was, I think that was a real advantage of, of that. Um, we also were able to move to a more hybrid model. So we used some live delivery using Zoom and then we had some breakout groups and students were in rooms with tutors and windows open and spread out and, and all those, those kind of things. But we were able to do that and, and I think we, we developed that. And actually from, from my point of view, what that did was it promoted more ownership at the, by colleagues across the university because they were having to deliver the tutor sessions. So, so that was a that was a great advantage. In terms of learning from this and moving on to the future, I, I think we have got lots of opportunities that come out of this. So although initially it was really challenging and, and I experienced those early issues of students just kind of walking away because they didn't want to be identified, it made me think about what we could do. The ed tech interview that you mentioned was, was really pushing me around those kind of solutions. So what can technology do? And I think it forced us to look at how we use different bits of software to engage our students. Um, uh, I still think we need more solutions around how we make it really easy for academic staff to, to embed and utilise a whole range of, of different tools in order to engage students. I mean, students and staff want it to be really simple and easy to use. I think the example today works really well of having the Zoom broadcast next to the questions and that makes it really easy for people to do. So I think academic staff want more of that. They also want a better sense of who's in the room. So when no one's got their camera on or just a few people, you see this kind of limited number of, 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 of faces, but you don't always get that sense of who's there and you don't really get that sense of who's engaging. 
So these were some of the things that we talked about with Adam Black when he was talking to me about how the, uh, the ed tech sector might be able to support us as, as academic colleagues moving forward. Um, but I've just completed a survey at, at one institution asking staff about how they adapted the, their learning and teaching, their assessments and their curriculum contents over the four over the three periods, sorry. So the first lockdown, the, sec the next academic year, and then this academic year. Um, and, and asked them particularly what, I, what they wanted to keep. And one of the things they talk about keeping is around the one-to-one -one meetings as those being really useful. And certainly our mentors have developed and found that to be not very helpful. So initially our mentors were doing all their work face to face and then they moved to an online model. They did some group sessions, but, but what, what staff and our mentors were able to find was that it's actually very flexible to, to schedule online meetings one to one. And actually for more non-traditional or more disadvantaged or diverse students, having the opportunity to have a meeting at a time that suits you has worked, has worked really well. Um, but overwhelmingly, what, what academic colleagues were talking about keeping was really a flipped learning model. And I think we've been working really hard in the higher education sector to encourage people to move away from didactic lecturing towards actually helping students to, to put learning into practice and, and, and to become much more active in their own learning process. So by being forced to, to use um, online uh, lectures and, and then sometimes being given some face-to-face -face time, Colleagues have started to see the advantage of, of delivering shorter lectures. There were quite a few comments in the survey around shorter lectures. And I think that's, again, something that we've known, that people's concentration doesn't last for ages. And it's much better to have short chunks and then put it into practice. Um, they also talked about archiving and making those resources available. And that's really good for non-traditional students that they can go back to materials, they can re-watch them. It's good for international students or students to whom English or, or whatever is not the first language. Um, and it's good for disabled students and it's good for all sorts of groups who want to go back and, and go over material again. It also facilitates those students who have to work. I did a focus group with students last week and they said, I have to work. It's not a choice, I have to work. And it's really important that I have those resources to go back to. And so COVID has, has created this kind of mind shift, which has been really powerful. So colleagues in the survey were talking very much about moving to this flipped learning model. And the other thing which I think they talked about, and is quite powerful, is, is changing assessments. So suddenly they had to move away from assessments which were based on an exam. And they also were very mindful then that students could quote unquote cheat because they wouldn't be able to be invigilated and, and, and watched. And this has forced academic colleagues, I think, to think more creatively about the kind of problems and assessments that they set. These kind of open book assessments that might take one day or one week or three days or whatever. And they're actually based on problem solving and applying knowledge. And that, of course, is what we need to be able to do. Information is readily available, but it's about how we use that information and create knowledge and solve problems. And those are some of the things that the academic colleagues that I was studying were really kind of talking about retaining. There were one or two who said, there's nothing good. I just want to go back to how it was before. But the majority of staff that commented were, were talking about that. So both within our I Belong project, and more generally, I think the higher education sector has changed. But our challenge is, if more students are spending less time on campus, how do we help them to all belong? And how do we create these sense of communities? And we have to have those tools to help us do it online. And we have to have some opportunities to work face to face and to create those kind of communities of practice, which will sustain, sustain those kind of relationships and support on an ongoing matter, even or an ongoing period, even if we're locked down or choosing not to come onto campus. Thank you, Liz. It's again, uh, as I said yesterday, listening to uh, this um, body of research you conducted now with uh, with staff, one really gets inspiration. What should be our next project? <laughs> because there is so much now. I, I as you said, uh, um, COVID accelerated uh, everything that was being done 
for the last 10, 20 years on changing the way things are done in education. And now we have all these opportunities to, to implement that in um, like first year was a bit uh, probably shaky for everyone, but now I think we, we are starting to see benefits and starting to adjust, uh, adjust to it. Um, so yes, I think that um, this mind shift that you you were saying is uh, is interesting to see where this will go in the in the next period, and it's also something for us to to look how I belong and then um, blend into that and change again. Yeah, we are changing our project all the time. <laughs> it seems like in these three years we had three different projects. Thank you, Liz. I would now um, like to uh, go maybe <clears throat> beyond the uh, uh, immediate academic uh, field and uh, ask Mary, considering uh, Echo's history of uh, working also on projects and uh, cooperating with, uh, with other type of employees, not just academia, but also academia, I would uh, like to ask you how we can connect this topic and the uh, connect and partner with, with others. So going beyond our first partners and then uh, reaching out to civil society, to um, different employers, because they will all need students who, who've been now trained in COVID times. Um, so my question is um, how, how this topic that we were, we were developing in the last three years concerns everyone else as well in society. And what, what do you see as trend there and in which direction it's going? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ivana, um, for your question. Um, it's, it's a big question, but let me say that um, a sense of belonging is not just related to uh, the experience in higher education. Uh, like Semya already mentioned in the beginning, uh, it starts, um, you know, in fact, at school, in primary school, and it continues uh, when you uh, arrive in higher education, you, you know, finish your bachelor, move to graduate education, and even moving to, um, towards the, the labor market. And it is something that um, is always, um, it's always something that, that, that is, is relevant to, to people, because as a person, you want to, you want to feel a sense of belonging everywhere you are and whether it is in your private context or your professional context. So I think that that's the, the first thing. So looking at a, a sense of belonging uh, before or after uh, higher education is equally important. And, um, and I think, but the question is, is, is how and, and who are the persons who can influence that part? And uh, what can you do? Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and how uh, does that relate to you as, as, as a person? And I think that um, since I belong is also very much connected to everything around diversity and inclusion, I think that we can, um, can consider that for some groups, um, feeling of, feelings of belonging are are more challenging than for other groups, and uh, and that's one of the things that uh, the the project uh, or the process of I belong, like Mar Marika mentioned, is um, is 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 not only looking at what needs to be done for students, but how can we also empower, for instance, uh, staff in higher education to make sure that they also feel empowered to, to, to um, work with students. And, and I think um, what was mentioned also be, before um, is that, you know, in higher education or in every context, you are always working towards whether it is um, education or within a working environment. You're, I think, uh, and in a working environment, I think a large task is for HR. The HR departments are always working what needs to be done to make sure that my colleagues feel a sense of belonging. And there are you know, many strategies, there's a lot of policy. And but there's also some red threats uh, going through society, and I think if we look at at diversity, um, you know, I think there's there's also the conversation about 
um, who is who belongs to the, the the mainstream or the dominant group? Who is the norm in society, and who is the norm in organizations, whether it's education or within, um, you know, the, the organizations who are um, who are working environments? And I think if you are not part of the norm, you always have to negotiate your identity. And I think that that's the, the journey that some people have, sometimes a lifelong journey uh, from primary education into the labor market, that, that that sense of belonging is, is, is cherished, but it's uh, not always easy to, um, you know, easy to, 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 to achieve. And I think um, also what, what Sophia already mentioned is that context matters. And so something that is uh, relevant to a certain organization, a certain context, um, would not be applicable in another context. And, you know, whether it is, it is regional, it is national, it is global or organizational, institutional. And I think that that is something that we have learned within uh, I Belong, that context matters. And, um, and, and, you know, and so like what, what Liz was, was saying is that context matters also when something like, you know, the pandemic happens is that you re have to rethink what, how you did your work and you have to uh, reshape that. And, and, and what Miriam uh, was, was saying, even implementing it in, within your own institution, it, it also matters if you're from a different department um, or, uh, you know, a University of Applied Sciences. So what we see in our work is that a sense of belonging is definitely also a conti continuation after higher education. And what we see, and this is the conversation we have with partners um, with our corporate partners, but also uh, partners in the public sector, is that creating a sense of belonging is very much related to creating uh, an inclusive uh, working environment. And, um, and I think that um, you asked for trends. And I think if I think one of the trends is that uh, societies are uh, very diverse in, uh, in a broad sense. And but there are certain uh, groups that are more have more challenges in um, being either excluded or having less opportunities than other groups. And I think um, with 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 I belong, we try to also with, for instance, the TTR, uh, the the t team teacher reflections. To, um, to focus on, on those kind of uh, challenges, something like what's mentioned, the power walk, you know, uh, to what extent are you able to, um, to uh, relate to the world of somebody else and what, what does it mean to, to your own communication? Um, so, you know, so, so that's definitely uh, uh, important and you know some developments like what we've seen with with um for instance um the me too you know me too uh black lives matter uh asian lives matter uh all kinds of social movements in 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 society are entering our 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 computers our you know our rooms and that are th those are um developments that are also affecting um how students um you know, and how, how individuals look at themselves and look at others. And I think that that's um, one of the biggest challenges. It is great that we are becoming more diverse um, through all kinds of developments uh, in the world, but um, how can we make sure that we understand what belonging means to individuals and how can we relate to that and uh, support each other with and and i think one of the things that what, what my one of my colleagues uh, pravini baburam who has been working with all of you um, i mean one of the things that she's always referring to is getting comfortable with the uncomfortable uh, there are uncomfortable conversations and we can't deny them we can't avoid them but we can have the conversation and and i think uh, an, an intervention like or a program like the dialogue days or a mentoring uh, uh, programs that has been part of I Belong is definitely one of those instruments, not the only instruments, but definitely um, 
in a very important uh, instruments to have that conversation with each other and you know to try to better understand each other and to also um, in influence mindset. Thanks, uh, Ivana. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think it's a beautiful way to close uh, because it, it, we we went from our own project uh, and our own topic to more kind of broader way to society, mentioning also organizations and uh, corporate partners I, and also what's happening in society in general with social movements. So I think it's it's good that we step back and see all the contexts that, uh, that were around us while we were working on the project. I also think that you kind of um, already answered in part one of the questions that we received, um, but you can uh, maybe comment a bit further. And I would like to uh, just add that when you were making that uh, we need to make sure that belong uh, to understand what belonging means to individuals um, for the audience that is listening. I think it's uh, interesting that uh, they stay with us for the next panel because we will be discussing with students and staff members what it means for them them and how it helped them uh, um, in how I belong helped them in their studies and also in their uh, work at universities. But uh, to go back to the question, um, there is uh, one uh, just oh, there were many. Uh, do you think it would be possible to use the I belong program applied to organizations, for example, or even to uh, put it uh, to other fields to, to corporate partners? So that was one of the questions I am seeing now. Um, yes, definitely, and and I think it, it, it the context is different, but I think it's it the question is how um, how to ensure that um, colleagues within your organization uh, can um, are being acknowledged for who who they are, that there is a common language, um, and but also what what do individuals need to feel that sense of belonging, and that's you know that that sensitivity. To, need, to, to, to have that conversation. I think that that's a crucial in, in every context. And I just want to mention uh, the last thing, but one of the things that I found very uh, interesting in I Belong is that uh, we gave students platform and, and, and a voice to also share and share their, um, their, 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 not their interest just, but also to, to share how they think about, um, you know, what it's, so that we don't talk for them, but that we talk with them and, uh, and that they were part of the development. Because I, for, for the future, I think uh, collaborating with students and other stakeholders to uh, develop uh, better solutions for existing issues is, uh, I think, another uh, interesting uh, innovation. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you for answering and also broadening up. Um, there was another question. I don't know who is interested to, to answer, but how did we evaluate uh, the success of our interventions? Anyone eager to answer this question? I can give it a try, Ivana. Um, uh, now, on a serious note, we um, uh, designed and developed uh, a monitoring uh, scheme for all the different interventions, which were, of course, interrelated in how we built those interventions. So, from a very scientific perspective, it would not be possible uh, to uh, investigate the single contribution of one of our interventions on uh, students belonging uh, or success, but we did evaluate among staff and among students um, how they appreciated uh, the interventions, but also uh, how it uh, may have impacted uh, their belonging uh, and success. So for students, uh, we developed uh, surveys which we implemented at various time slots uh, during the first academic year in the uh, course programs in which we uh, implemented I Belong activities. Uh, we also organized focus group interviews uh, uh, with students. We evaluated the team teacher reflections among staff via evaluation forms, but we also did focus group interviews with the staff teams who participated in the team teacher 
reflection. Um, and for the uh, students mentoring program, uh, we had intervision with the mentors involved uh, as peer mentors in the scheme. Uh, and we also uh, interviewed them via focus group interviews uh, every year in the program. So this is where we have both our quantitative and qualitative uh, data to evaluate to our best extent uh, the impact of our program. Thank you, Marike. And if I'm not mistaken, I, I have to compliment the team because if I'm not mistaken, this was never part of the project. It was all on the team initiative to because it's a very research oriented team. So it was additional uh, tasks uh, task for all of you. And it was not easy, especially when COVID <laughs> broke everything. Thank you. There was uh, maybe we we have uh, one more question. There there were two, but uh, let's because I'm aware of the time. Um, as, as a question for Sophia: How did you decide which changes which changes should be implemented to local context? Um, well, I don't know if I understand correctly the question to the local my context or when you when you took i belong uh, this is how i would understand when you took i belong to porto uh, partner mm -hmm. uh, to to polytechnic partner mm -hmm. yeah well when i uh, from that experience uh, i think that the most valuable uh, learning was precisely the fact that we we should never take for granted what we think we know even if we are familiar with uh, you know with some kind of reflection regarding inclusion, diversity. Sometimes in our own context, we are blind regarding other aspects of diversities that uh, are not so visible. So from that experience outside my department, I was able to make um, another read of my own department uh, and of some you know, struggles and uh, that we are not so aware of because we are very close to our own uh, content. And also because we think that, we don't think that we know it all, but we think that we know a lot about diversity and inclusion and the best practices. And sometimes we don't know everything. So I think that uh, one of the things is that idea that we need to, to, to do some collaborative research in other contexts that uh, we'll be implementing I'm very long, I think is the same lessons for me and for my context. Thank you. I, I think this is uh, the answer to the question. Thank you, Sophia. Well, um, we are 10 minutes beyond the schedule. Uh, so what we are supposed to do now, uh, besides thanking my colleagues for, for this uh, nice panel, uh, thank you all. Um, the next panel is with uh, students and staff members from um, Erasmus University and the University of Osnabrück. So stay with us because we have uh, a short break, five to seven minutes break, and then we continue with the, with the next session. Thank you.